Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Dennis Beck, I'm one of the founders of SBS. We appreciate you joining today. Joining me is uh, Sergey Sokolov, who's director of our strategic consulting solutions, as well as Jim Lucas, who's an executive consultant, both with SBS. So we really are uh, pleased to be here. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, we're going to be talking today about um, intelligent design solutions. Uh, we'll be focused on the communications industry, although I know a number of you attending are involved with other networked infrastructures such as gas and electric utilities, water utilities, and uh, we will be having information I hope that's very pertinent for all of you too as we talk about you know, intelligent design and integration and, and these very pertinent topics. Um, a little bit about us at SBS and, and uh, to give you some background. Uh, we are a company that was founded almost 20 years ago now, and we provide intelligent design solutions for networked infrastructure. So utilities and telecommunications, government organizations. Uh, we also are very focused on data integration. So as a company, our original history came from systems integration and complex geospatial integration with CAD systems and and enterprise resource planning and such. Um, that's the general background we come from. Uh, we're broadcasting today. I'm in Littleton, Colorado. Um, Jim is in the San Antonio area and Sergey is joining us from Ottawa. But uh, the company is based in Littleton and we have a, an office in Melbourne, Australia also. Uh, we've had the good pleasure of working now with over 200 organizations uh, all over the world. And uh, we're in, as a company, I'd say one of the things that's particularly unique about us is that we have a strategic relationship with Autodesk and uh, we've been doing Autodesk integration for, for many years now. And in uh, about five years ago, we entered a relationship where we uh, took over responsibility for Autodesk's portfolio of applications to support design for, for network infrastructure and utilities. So, uh, we also, though, are an ESRI partner, and uh, so we uh, are an ESRI uh, specialist for utility network, and uh, we had the, the the good news of recently winning an ESRI partner award. So we bring kind of an interesting blend of the, the worlds of CAD and design with the worlds of geospatial, which are, are so also important for critical infrastructure uh, design these days. So. A little bit about our agenda. I'm going to give just a few introductory comments about intelligent design solutions and uh, integration related to intelligent design solutions. And then I'll turn the time over to Jim Lucas and Jim will be showing us a demonstration of, of intelligent design solutions integrated, showing uh, telecommunications workflows. And uh, as he shows that, he'll be showing integration both with CAD and geospatial and enterprise asset management. And then we'll turn the time over to Sergey Sokolov and Sergey will be showing us uh, some specific geospatial integration around CAD and, and GIS in, in utility design workflows. After that, we'll wrap up with questions and answers. And uh, from a question and answer standpoint, we would ask that you take your uh, questions and enter them into the chat box uh, when you come up with them. There's a bit of a time delay that we, we need to deal with. So as those questions queue up, we will be, go ahead and be answering those at the, at the end of the presentation today. So it's just a really exciting time and having worked in technology for so many years, decades now, um, there's just always things going on. And the things that I'm showing on the slide aren't that different than what I would have shared with you 10 years ago or maybe even 20 or more years ago. Um, processing power just continues and continues to, to zoom up. Um, the cloud provides us nearly infinite processing power if you want it. Um, bandwidth is so incredibly powerful. We're so connected and mobile computing and is a result of all that processing power and all that bandwidth available on small devices. Of course, the whole world of data just continues to grow. You know, big data was coined many years ago, and you know, it's just data is getting bigger and bigger, and the things we can do with it from a, a processing standpoint lend to you know all kinds of things that are are new, but really not that new, such as artificial intelligence, which has been around for for many decades itself. Um, but we also have challenges, you know, that are always going on. 
And those challenges give us opportunities to take advantage of all the, the incredible investment and activity that's going on in, in technology and, and resources. You know, COVID-19 really changed our workforce to move very remote. Um, and of course, all of us who deal with networked infrastructure know that it's aging. It needs to be continually modernized. It's obviously hugely promoted in the news right now with uh, in particularly in the United States with a, an infrastructure bill that's, that's being reviewed. Um, but our workforce is changing too. Uh, our engineering workforce is changing. Our construction workforce is dramatically changing. And as we get more and more digitized, we have challenges with security and we have limited availability of resources. Um, our population is impacting the climate. And all of this point, points to doing things better and doing things smarter and, and continuing to progress and, and doing change. And uh, you know, we, we feel we're right at the heart of intelligent design solutions as it relates to uh, networked infrastructure and designing infrastructure. And I wanted to just share a, for, for a minute or two, you know, our perspectives of what makes an intelligent design solution um, before I turn get to, to more details of, of design and workflow and turn it over to my colleagues. But uh, one of the key elements of an intelligent design solution is that it be model based. And uh, for myself as a, as a person with an engineering background, um, when I was a designer, I would create lines and points and symbols and all those things, uh, usually on uh, paper and pencil or with ink and mylar. And uh, that eventually became digital as we moved to CAD systems. But you know, model-based systems are really systems that take that design to the next level in terms of really creating intelligent objects typically in fact always 3d um, with relationships and properties unique identifiers um, so that they can can travel between different systems and share information with other systems um, those systems also really need to be configurable in nature too and uh, when something's configurable that means we can define rules and behaviors so it can be properly validated um, rather than having to custom code properties into systems. And as these systems start to change, they have to be able to adapt and adapt to different uh, elements that are going on. And that really is a key part of an intelligent design solution. Next, it needs to be geo enabled. And we come from a really strong geospatial background here at SBS. So, uh, you know, we you know, all things are kind of GIS, but when we look at the tremendous amount of spatial information that can be now used to influence design, it's, it's one thing to build a model, but if that model isn't in the context of all the surrounding elements, uh, you know, the weather patterns or the soil conditions or anything else, um, you're really missing out on, on getting the most information to, to create the best design. And of course, these systems need to be integrated, so they need to be working with the, the systems that uh, support initiation of the work, uh, managing the assets, you know, costing, finance, all those different integrated systems um, need to be part of the entire solution. Otherwise, it's just another standalone piece of information. And finally, it really needs to be comprehensive in nature. And you know, I, I think maybe the best way to say this, going back to early in my career, is you know, don't forget about the O-ring. And uh, I had an opportunity to inter interview and nearly took a job with a company that designed space shuttle engines. And uh, this was prior to the, the terrible thing that happened with the Challenger. And uh, so as, as we design, you know, our focus is on being able to design all elements of the design, you know, from the simplest little system extensions to the very massive capital improvements, you have to have your design workflows, your asset management, your integration, be able to address all of those. Otherwise, you're really missing out on the advantages of, of intelligent design. There's a lot of talk uh, about digital twins and uh, digital twins are a, a really interesting concept. Um, but again, I, I will say that the whole foundation of digital twins has been around for a long time. Um, intelligent design is really critical to this because this is the starting point or the foundation where this object is really created, where its life begins, so to speak, uh, you know, certainly at a conceptual level. So you know, design is that supporting standpoint and as, 
that design moves to the build process and ultimately to provisioning and to operations, you know, it must comprehensively, comprehensively define what is being done. And design in particular is really important because it's typically the most detailed representation that that object will have, you know, at its inception. You know, just location is fine or a symbolic representation is fine, but design contains all the properties and relationships and such to, to truly define the object. And uh, it goes then and influences traceability, you know, what materials were used to create this object. Um, what is the forward looking supply chain? What are the engineering aspects, the safety and quality related issues all the way down through the life cycle of the object um, when it gets decommissioned? And that pattern, many of people have heard about digital twins, but that pattern, that path that that, that intelligent object follows uh, is oftentimes referred to as a digital thread, which I think from a design standpoint, from an asset management standpoint is a really important concept. And as that object that gets divide, designed advances through its life cycle, it touches a lot of systems. And as it touches those systems, there's more and more information associated with it. You know, asset behavior, um, just different engineering properties, you know, inspections, you know, refurbishments. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of information that an intelligent design system then spawns as it goes through its life cycle. So with that as a background, let's talk a little bit about intelligent design solutions a little more specifically. Now at SBS, our intelligent design solution for, for networked infrastructure is called automated utility design. And uh, we're going to just give a little background so we can then show how this applies to an intelligent design you know, integrated workflow. So automated utility design, you'll hear me call it AUD, is a 3D model based platform and it actually is built as a plug-in to AutoCAD. And uh, so it uses the Map 3D tool set, which gives it its geospatial enablement. And when we implement uh, the AED product in an organization, what we typically do is take the standards that organization has those, and then we convert those into behaviors that really influence the intelligent design that allow us to create models, components that then get laid out as intelligent objects that create builds of materials, they feed the supply chain, they generally become integrated with the overall enterprise to support that digital thread that I just shared in the previous slide. So uh, AUD is uh, a focal point of this, but the integration is a very critical component too. And uh, we'll, as you uh, see the, the demonstration of the workflows, one of the key elements is something called the Utility Data Hub which is a configurable integration suite that will be, be supporting the workflows that you'll be seeing today. Uh, we talked just a little bit about geo enablement and we've borrowed this slide from our friends at Esri. And uh, if you are familiar with GIS, uh, many of you we know uh, work very closely with the ArcGIS product. And uh, so as we show the geo enablement aspects today, you'll be seeing the ArcGIS system and the AUD is actually a geo enabled system, so it works very closely with ArcGIS. It's not an Esri application, but it works within the Esri ecosystem. So if you look at ArcGIS and its enterprise environment, it's a service oriented architecture. And so AUD actually works within that architecture, so it shares you know, many of the same resources that are involved, for example, data resources and it can be using this it uses the same security model you know, working within that platform yet it has the unique aspects of design and the flexibility to be able to create and design in a, in a you know a, a relatively unconstrained manner which is what is so important to designers and of course you know, design requires a lot of information as we'll be seeing when we show our upcoming example and so being able to use resources of the GIS such as utility network traces and those kinds of activities to to influence the, the design and, and how the design is carried out is also a key part of it. So you know, as you watch this today, uh, I think you'll you'll note the uh, geospatial enablement aspects of this. You know, AED has had a telecommunications model for many, many years. We've recently updated it here at SBS and 
So this is the first opportunity we, we will be having to, to show our updated communications model. Um, when we look at the, the model and, and what is typically involved in, in any telecommunications system, there tend to be multiple elements involved. There's a structural network, which is shown at the bottom here related to the facilities, you know, the, the manholes and the structures, the poles, um, the ducts, the conduits, those things that actually really handle the network. But then there's the physical network layer that lives up above it, which is, are all those elements that tend to be involved with, with telecommunications um, physical networks. And that's really the domain that uh, AUD is playing in, in terms of laying out and building those elements. At the top level, you get involved with the geospatial systems that manage the broader network and the related business applications that take that information and perform network related services. So uh, just to give you a little positioning of what you'll be seeing today, um, the, the focus of our activities tend to be living in this, this bluish colored box. So. I want to move now and talk in just a little bit, this is the last slide here, about enterprise integration and workflow, because workflow obviously is really key to intelligent design. And as we look at this slide here, we have multiple boxes. You know, we have the, the design environment here. We have the, the work and asset management environment here. This could involve any of a, a number of different systems. Um, oftentimes it can be a product like SAP, or Maximo or CGI has offerings. There's just a number of different systems that do this. Um, there's geospatial. We are focused as an Esri partner on ArcGIS Enterprise for this, this presentation today. And then there are planning systems that may be providing high level design information, conceptual design information. And of course, throughout the life cycle, both at the front end of designs at the at the construction side, at the asset management side, mobile technology is, is always involved. So when we look at the workflows we'll be showing you today and discussing, you know, typically a job initiates and that job initiates through some form of work, work management system or work order system. And uh, so from a design standpoint, intelligent design needs to be able to incorporate that information within the design console and as well as getting the design work order, it needs to be able to pull in the elements that are defined in the, the appropriate asset management system. We oftentimes refer to these as compatible units, which are assemblies of units that are used to build intelligent designs. The uh, high level plans that may be developed, uh, the planning information is typically incorporated in the design environment at the initiation of the design. And if field verification has happened, that oftentimes can be involved. And of course, key to all of this is taking that geospatial information, that rich you know, land fabric that's available to, in, to influence the design, as well as any asset information that would be residing in the GIS. That also needs to be made available to the designer. So the designer has all the best information to, to perform the design. And, and that ultimately that design happens it goes through an approval cycle and it updates the work and asset management system. Estimates are created and ultimately it goes into a build stage. So you know, many organizations will print this out, create maps and sketches and all those kinds of things. Um, hopefully, and we're seeing more and more organizations are generating digital construction packages now and those go to the, the field, uh, get generated and ultimately it gets built and uh, oftentimes it gets built different um, than the design. So there's an as building process, obviously, and, uh, which is critical to supporting the design life cycle. And here is where things I think are getting so much more interesting. You know, the need to have this information from the design, from the as built back into the, the networked plant on as timely a basis as possible with all the advanced digital and network management applications become so very critical. And, and so those changes need to go typically to the geospatial system so that they can be updating all the other related systems, be they asset management or, or other specific network management related systems. So this tends to be the general work management workflow and, and where intelligent design really plays in, in managing, monitoring and streamlining this kind of workflow. And of course, they change. They're different between organizations. They are different as time moves on. And so there's quite a need to keep the, these systems flexible and mobile. So 
So with that in mind, that's the you know, little background on intelligent design, intelligent design workflow. Uh, we're going to shift gears now and uh, move into demonstration. So I'm going to turn it over to Jim Lucas, who, uh, uh, as I mentioned, is an executive consultant for SBS, and Jim will be um, now showing us this uh, workflow um, using automated utility design, ArcGIS, and, and related systems. So Jim, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Dennis. Appreciate it. All right. So uh, a couple of ground rules. Uh, you know, as Dennis mentioned earlier, we, we'd appreciate any questions that you have during this presentation, uh, but please put them in the Q&A box. So type in your questions so that we can get to them uh, and make sure we don't miss any of them. Uh, my name is Jim Lucas. I'll be push, pushing the buttons for you today. Uh, I'll be playing the role of a designer, and uh, I am down near San Antonio area in Texas. Sergey will be playing the role of a GIS technician, and he will be up in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, I'll be submitting my design over to Esri at the end, uh, you know, through the cloud, simulating a, a workflow where a designer is remote from a GIS technician. So. So you see on your screen right now is automated utility design. I'm going to go and do a new CAD drawing. In this particular case, I'm going to pick a template uh, for communications. Our template contains all of our configuration for AUD. So I might have a comms template. I might have an electric template. I might have a gas template. I might have a, an electric and gas and comms template. So the configuration of features and attributes and what symbols belong to what features and how they connect and and all those kinds of things are part of the configuration that goes into AUD and all of that is stored in a portable template drawing type uh, standard. I'm going to go over here to our work order browser which is part of utility data hub. This is our interface to EAM systems, SAP, Maximo, you know, uh, others. There's a bunch of them out there on the market, but those are the two most prominent here uh, lately. Uh, you can see that it lists, you know, uh, information uh, of designs, work orders that are assigned to me as a designer. I can search and query and filter and see information from my work management system presented here to me inside of AUD. I'm actually going to select this work order here at this particular address and leverage our geo enabled capabilities to go to that address. So I've actually used work order information from SAP to jump to this address here and, and kind of find out where I'm going to be doing my work. I'm also going to link this drawing. So I've started a drawing based on a template and then I've come in and I've said, you know, I'm going to use this drawing to to resolve this work request. So it's going to tell me now that I'm linked. It's going to rename everything. It's going to assign drawing properties based on that work order that we can use in title blocks. Uh, it's going to save it off to a document management system or a SharePoint or a site. This work order uh, links that drawing to this uh, work order browser, links that drawing to this work order so that I can come back here and get it and work with it at any time. So uh, what you're seeing here in the background is a streaming uh, version of Esri's ArcGIS Enterprise. I'm actually seeing a feature service uh, or web map version of, of Esri. So this is utility network for comms near Naperville. And uh, you know, as a designer, before you ever start designing, you have to gather more information. And, and even though this is a streamed version of ArcGIS, uh, I have the capability to do traces and searches and queries. So I'm, I'm going to come up here and, and click on this, uh, you know, comms feature here. And it's going to come back and tell me where you clicked. There were these fibers and cables. And it shows me that uh, this is a Roosevelt Road distribution one. So I'll click on that and it'll say, well, which which one do you want to search? And I'll click on the tube and then it says, which fiber do you want to trace? And I'll click on a fiber that I want to trace. So I, even though I'm in CAD, I still have the capability to trace upstream and find the, the feed point for this fiber. 
uh, to see where it feeds to, to, to get more information from, um, from you know, the, uh, the, the Esri uh, repository. Uh, I can also come in and select and do uh, a WMS feature query. So uh, back into my design here, uh, we've gone to our area. We started doing our background research, learning about the area that we wanted to do. Uh, I'm also going to turn on a background map. So let me go ahead and show hybrid here. There we go. So uh, my background map here can be any kind of WMS service or, or feature service. Um, it can be uh, Google, Bing, it can be Esri REST services, uh, whatever kind of uh, you know, mapping information you have available, we can also stream into the drawing. So I've done my research, I've gathered up information, I have some context you know, with the background map, and I'm, I'm actually ready to do my design. Once I've identified the area that I want, <clears throat> we have a run import command. And this run import just allows you to pick an area and it brings those features in from Esri. It, it transforms them from Esri uh, features into AUD features. It, it brings over the intelligence and the attribution and the connectivity, everything that you would need to see as a designer, but it transforms it into the designer's world, right? So instead of using a, a, a symbology from a GIS world, you get a symbology from a designer's world. Instead of uh, you know everything being center line, maybe it's offset a different way. It, it corresponds and relates to the way that your design world looks when it transforms those. In addition, we augment the data when we bring it in uh, to add in any kind of um, you know, analysis values that we need or design specific values that we need in order to bring those across. So over here, you're actually seeing uh, feature information. This is copied directly from the GIS uh, and uh, is populated from the GIS and it also it brings in connectivity, attribution, those sorts of things. Okay, so we have uh, here in our drawing an existing you know electric layout so this is kind of single phase electric that's going down one side of the road we have brought in our data from our gis on the other side of the road and we're going to start laying out some stuff uh, from my comms menu up here i'm going to go to our defaults and these are all configurable so just just keep that in mind that everything you're seeing even down to the symbology, the menu commands, the layout, the, what's in these drop downs, the name of the drop downs, what shows up in here, it's all just configuration for us, which allows us to be very flexible with our implementation and adapt to what you need to see in your design process. I'm going to switch this over to fiber connectors. I'm going to pick a two port fiber connector. And uh, I'm going to leave it in duct, but I'll switch over to fiber and do a two, two cable fiber. And I'm going to be in duct bank for this. I, uh, I'm going to go first and I'm going to add some connectors to this hub. So I'm, I'm basically going to you know, put some more connections available for my fiber. So I'm, I'm just clicking on it. But what that's doing is actually slotting in some new connections. You can see that there's there's now new fiber connectors inside of this hub terminator. I'm going to use uh, one of these and I'm going to change it over to a medium converter because I'm going to use it for my coax later. And I'm going to leave the other two fibers for the fiber that I'm going to run. This medium converter you can see automatically added the in and the three coax out uh, you know, automatically for you as a designer just by switching it to medium converter. I'll go here and now draw a comms cable. You'll notice as I hover, you'll, you can see it pop up a uh, little blue knuckle and that's how we handle connectivity. So uh, as you're drawing as a CAD drawer, uh, a drafter, you, you're just looking for that blue knuckle and then we click to set our connectivity. And from this point on, it is very much 
uh, a CAD placement command. You, you've started a CAD placement command. You can do arcs and offsets and it, it you know, you're not losing any of your CAD capabilities here because we are based purely in AutoCAD. I'm going to go ahead and uh, place a pedestal here. Again, just looking for my, my knuckle. And uh, let's talk a little bit about what just happened, right? I'm, I'm drawing in CAD, right? When I draw in CAD, AUD is automatically going in and creating the features and the attributes. There are rules that set strand colors and group colors, as well as port name froms and port name twos. So you can notice that this, this network interface has two fiber connectors, a 91 and 92. This one set the 92, this one set the 91. So it's auto connecting, it's finding connectors, setting fiber to fiber connectors, creating your interface uh, units and all your fibers and attributes. In addition, it's creating all the materials that are associated with it. So you can see that it, it knew that I drew that and that it needed 1,026 feet of duct and fiber. It added in any kind of sweeps or pedestals. It ran any validation rules that are pertinent to your design process, as well as did pulling tension calculations. So since this is a cable in a duct, it ran the pulling tension calculation and determined whether or not it could be pulled in a certain direction or another direction and display that on the map for you. So drawing in CAD gets you all the stuff that you see over here, gets you materials, it gets you feature, connectivity, attribution, all the things you need to load into the GIS later. It can run analysis, it can run validation, all just by drawing here, okay? I'm going to switch over to do uh, coax now. So I'm going to switch over to a uh, coax connector and let's change the cable. I'm going to still stay in duct, but I'll switch to ducted coax. And here I'll do a high gain amplifier. Okay. Now I'm going to go and draw here again, uh, just watching for my connection point. So connecting there, coming over here. And now I'm going to snap to the vault. So this is an existing vault. The scenario here is that there's existing electric running through here. Uh, I could have added it with AUD. I could have brought it in from a GIS system. I could have brought it in from a developer. Uh, it doesn't really matter to us, but it, you, you have an existing vault here that I'm going to snap to uh, in order to place this. And I'm going to do the same thing going down here to the end. Snap to the existing vault and then I'll come out of the vault and off to the left just so that I could put my amplifier out to the left of the design. Go here and place my amplifier. OK, so essentially I've uh, come off of my hub terminator. Uh, and I've placed, uh, you know, a coax cable joint trench with existing electric out to a high gain amplifier. Uh, now I'll check up here and I'll actually switch over to just direct bearing. So instead of being in a duct, I might switch to direct bearing. And uh, I'm going to change these to two port taps still with my coax connector. And then instead of picking with duct, I'll pick without duct. Snap off of here. This time I'll use an offset. So I'll offset off of this and it just asked me to, you know, where is my end point? And I'll, I'll just go down here and enter an end point. So that's been placed. Uh, now I'm going to switch over to place two port connectors. So I'll go ahead and Place my enclosure again, and maybe I want a two port connector here between these houses. And then maybe I want another one down near this house. And uh, even though it's, it's at the end of line, I'm going to place a two port connector down here, but I'll go ahead and select it and I'll change it to end of line instead of a two port connector. 
can see that it recommends what it thinks it needs there at the end. Uh, I could pick these other ones, but this is what it recommends for this particular situation. So I'm going to pick my end of line. You'll notice that the symbology changes, but because this is a model and not just a CAD drawing, because it's modeling the features and understands what's connected to what, the symbology changes, the material changes, the validations rerun, the analysis reruns. Anytime you make a change to this model, AUD recalculates all these things on the fly for you. So the entire time I've been drawing, it's just increasing my bill of material list so that I can uh, then submit it downstream to my EAM. Now, uh, some folks uh, might, you know, draw stubs out of here. Some folks might draw, you know, all the way to the house. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter uh, for us. You know, it's whatever your design process calls for. So, uh, you know, I've gone here and drawn and shown that this goes all the way to the house. Some folks just leave a short stub. Some folks don't don't show anything at all. But uh, in this particular case, we're going to show that stub there or this uh, full service to a house there. So, so far I've gone ahead and, uh, you know, laid out fiber. I've laid out uh, connectors at the end, pedestals. I've put high gain amplifiers, ports. Uh, my bill of materials is populated. It's running validations for my workflow. So nothing's going wrong with my design. Nothing that I need to check with. Uh, it's been running my duct pooling, cable pooling, tension calculations, uh, all just from my drawing. I'm going to take advantage of the modeling that we have in AUD to select this coax and uh, we we added a rule just to show some possibilities. Uh, again, this is, you know, uh, uh, not really a prototype, but this is, you know, our first shot at what we think this comms world should look like. So we we went ahead and added this show stats attribute. And uh, when I come to the validation, you can see there's now something new there. Uh, what this show stats does is it, it starts at the end point of the line and it starts tracing upstream until it finds, you know, a, a amplifier or a, a network hub. And what you're seeing here is that uh, there is 545 feet of cable. So it's 545 feet from this end point to this high gain. It ran into a high gain amplifier and it ran across two ports be between here and here. By configuring some dB values, you know, whether it's a plus or a minus, depending on what they are, and assuming, you know, some, some frequencies, you can actually put together an estimate that at the end of this line from, from this high gain down to here is going to be, uh, you know, a, a 9.5 dB loss, which gives you about a 14.5 a estimated dB at the end of the line. So uh, by having these connectivities and the, the ability to have features and attributes and configurable attributes, we could add in and, and augment the Esri data with, you know, DB loss values and, and estimate something at the end, which is we thought was kind of cool. All right. Uh, next phase. Um, what I'm going to do now is move into construction prints and construction type stuff. Uh, so the first thing you have to understand is that in order to do a, uh, a decent cable pulling analysis, you have to be able to uh, uh, work in 3D. So I'm going to switch over to 3D and I'm going to turn off some things. So let me turn these off and let me turn this off. Zoom. Sorry, got to zoom back around. This is what we've laid out now in, uh, you know, in uh, without all the background map noise. So you can see we're coming off of the pole. We're coming through here, coming up uh, into this particular pedestal. So I'm able to to actually show in 3D and and use this as the actual length of the cable in order to do my cable pulling correctly. Um, then when we look over here, you'll be able to see, you know, here's my coax that comes into this one. And let's see where else we can go. Um, so that's all happening behind the scenes. 
Um, I do have the capability, uh, and I'll show you in a, in a second. I do have the capability to control down to the individual ports on vaults. So I'll show you that here in a second. But I also want to talk a little bit about um, my details. So when you're generating construction prints, we have the capabilities to do details. And the details here could be something as simple as showing a ground line and the depth of it beneath it. Or we could, let's get rid of that detail. And we could insert uh, another detail that shows something complex like this conduit bank section. So the, the difference between a, a detail and a call out is that our details actually show you and can interact with this trench to show you, you know, where this feature sits in that trench. I can I can shift it around and you'll notice when I select that feature, it brings up the attributes and the feature over here. So a detail is, is an intelligent configurable annotation, whereas an annotation uh, while it relies on the intelligence in there is generally just text, right? So I might might say that this this has an annotation of this for the cable, whereas this detail shows me more information about it. And that that detail um, can see here. There you go. So you could also put details on here uh, as well as generate work locations. So I'm going to select you know everything that goes down this side and I'm going to set a work location and uh, this is how you would uh, group things for your work management system and all it does is say that you know everything here is associated uh, material wise to a single work location then this could be passed over to SAP or Maximo if your work management is uh, you know the type that groups those sorts of things so I'm going to skip ahead. I'm going to pull a Martha, Martha, Martha Stewart and open up one that is, you know, already baked uh, just to show you what this might look like at the end. So here's a very similar layout to what we just did, uh, but it has, you know, more details, more work locations. Here's material list tables that have been generated, annotations for, for cables and taps. When I come down here and take a look, I have more layout uh, of material tables down here, uh, conduit bank sections, vault details. So uh, if I go over to 3D on this one, you can actually see that the, the conductors are coming into you know, certain places on the vault and I'm able to control where they are coming into the vault. So if, if you need to map down to that level or want to map down to that le level, that's available. Um, as well as uh, all of your typical CAD construction print type stuff, right? So at, at this point in time, it is very much a CAD system and multi-plotting, multi-layouts, all those sorts of things are available for you. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and submit now. So I'm actually gonna come over to my GIS and I'm gonna run my export, okay? So uh, everything that we've done so far has been uh, tracked. So all the changes that I've made to this drawing uh, has been tracked and I've gone ahead and submitted it over to Sergey. The only other thing as a designer that you would do is then submit your work over to your work management system just to complete the loop on those two. So uh, Sergey, I'll let you go ahead and take it from here and, and bring the data back to the GIS. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Sergey, and uh, for the next 10 minutes, I'll be play playing a role of uh, GIS technician. I'm based in Ottawa, um, and as a GIS uh, technician, I'm um, uh, focused on mapping of network assets, structures, and devices, and um, uh, managing communication circuits. Uh, so it's maintaining integrity of uh, data and the valid topology of the communication network are absolutely critical in my job. So for this, I use uh, ArcGIS uh, Pro from Esri with the utility network for communication. That's what you see on the screen. Um, and uh, it provides a real flexibility for us to uh, enable configuration of communication assets and uh, 
uh, with all the details, including non-spatial objects that uh, were introduced by Esri and now available in utility network for communications, such as connectors, strands. And that's what uh, we also used um, as a part of uh, in, in a design to model that same kind of environment. Um, when I run on JS Pro, uh, I'm connect it is connected to ArcGIS Enterprise using feature services. And for this configuration, as uh, Jim explained, uh, we connected to ArcGIS Enterprise and the geodatabase that have been staged in the cloud. Uh, so our team, as you see, is scattered across multiple regions and having that ArcGIS Enterprise in the cloud uh, uh, really uh, helps us to work remotely. Um, so the first, uh, at the start of my day, I, I would use uh, SBS uh, Utility Data Hub plugin for ArcGIS Pro, and uh, I can uh, refresh and look at the list of assigned to me uh, work orders. And uh, uh, I can uh, see that number of work orders been assigned. I click on, on the work order, and that's uh, uh, 465 was just created by Jim and a few minutes ago. Um, and as per the uh, my process, uh, it uh, been assigned to me and I need to update uh, GIS with uh, all the data, all the changes done in design. Uh, good news that um, um, uh, SBS plugin allows me to review the changes um, in uh, done in design before applied to GIS. This is really important for me as the GIS owner. I want to be in the full control of what is um, being uh, changed and how that impact my uh, GIS, my utility network. Uh, with uti with um, uh, the plugin, I can really zoom to location of the work. Um, and I can explore uh, the proposed uh, changes. So we, uh, for example, I can see there was a modification done to Hub Terminator. I can click on the proposed change and the plugin shows me uh, the existing and proposed value. So we added uh, in our design a couple of connectors and there was a, a fiber cable added. Uh, so I can look at communication line and there is access fiber cable. It, I click on it, it shows me new attributes coming from design, proposed values, and it highlights on the screen. It's just a, a location of the cable. It just shows me where the features to, to be constructed. It's pseudo graphic. Um, I can um, I see the fiber cable is uh, uh, contains a feature. So in utility network for communication, it's really important that we build proper relationships. It's not only about the feature, it's about containment. So there is a non-spatial uh, strands communication objects inside that fiber cable. And uh, uh, it's also contained in the duct. So that's part, that's what came from the design. And I can see all the level of details. I can switch and look at non-spatial objects, uh, communication age. In this case, we have two fiber strands and uh, they are contained in access cable and they are connected to, to uh, two connectors uh, on junction objects. Um, so that really helps me to uh, look at all the details. I can preview uh, the design. So this is design done in this area. Um, and uh, really it's just, uh, matter of, of uh, uh, reviewing and uh, executing uh, all the changes. As a GIS uh, uh, technician and the owner of my data, I am comfortable with the proposed changes and SBS plugin uh, offers me a single button solution, just execute all the proposed transactions. Uh, what's happening now is the RGS Pro reads uh, all the proposed changes coming from the design tool AUD and uses ArcGIS APIs to update utility network with all the proposed changes, including not only creating features, but setting all the required relationships, association, containment, connectivity. And this is all done as per instructions sent from the design. So GIS and design are really integrated and exchange and uh, the transactional updates. 
So as you can see, transaction is done, updates completed. You read there are like 49 features created in the job. Um, and the, by the way, that's important. And once we start the process, uh, plugin actually created a branch version. So all the changes are contained within the version I can review and modify. There are a number of uh, uh, features being modified and uh, new features added. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, it also tells me that uh, there are green marks. That means all the rules have been adhered to and uh, we make sure that design AUD is aligned and fully um, 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 compliant with the rigid set of rules in utility network. Uh, so the next step uh, uh, to uh, validate topology that will uh, basically run additional checks in in a, a utility network and it uh, shows me success means again reassuring that everything what was passed from a design tool adheres to rigid standards of um, uh, of the communication model uh, and uh, including uh, all the aspects of asset management. So let's explore that uh, what was created in, in my version. So I select the coax uh, cable here and I can see there is a, a trench uh, and with a direct buried uh, coax cable uh, and uh, we can drill down and see there is a strand and this strand is actually connected to two connectors at the end. Uh, it basically we use out of the box uh, uh, capability of RGS Pro to show that um, uh, all the design data is properly uh, implemented in utility network. And just to make sure that um, um, as a mapper, I just want to confirm that everything is completed. The best way to do it is just to run trace. So I can select uh, this uh, tra uh, strand of coax and uh, uh, use it to um, uh, start a trace uh, for uh, connected features. I will uh, select include a container so you will see those uh, trace run on a non-spatial objects. Um, but now you can see it uh, really traces the coax network and terminates it on the hub terminator. So as a mapper, what I need to do is now just to finalize, connect my proposed design that is already implemented, automatically created all the features connectivity to the existing network. They do the final link of the uh, medium converter um, uh, fiber to the network and then um, um, uh, reconcile the job uh, and promote it to live, uh, merge it into live version. So that's basically my, my job is done. And as a mapper, I press one button, completed uh, implementation of design, and I'm ready to move to the next job assigned to me and waiting in the queue. Uh, that basically completes the end-to-end -end process. Uh, we have started with design, uh, with the design, pass it to JS, and it's updated, and I'm ready to the next job. All right, thank you, Sergey. Um, appreciate that for both you and, and Jim, and uh, and uh, we we really uh, enjoyed that, and I hope you have enjoyed it too. We now have a little bit of time for questions, and uh, so uh, um, wel welcome any questions you have. We have had a couple that have come up, and um, Sergey, I'm just going to put a question to you though. Um, when you are performing a design. Um, do you have to post it right away to the GIS or can you pre-post or, or what should the process be in a, in a given organization for, for doing that? Oh, that's a really good question. And uh, we've uh, seen uh, uh, different ways to how a utility is implemented. Some re uh, recommend to pre-post uh, to make it available uh, to other um, stakeholders in the organization, visualize it, and it's fully supported in uh, uh, utility data hub. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, when Jim pressed button post uh, to GIS, what's happening, it's really uh, taken all the GIS uh, design features and posted in, in the hosted feature layer of 
uh, GIS, ArcGIS Enterprise, so that can be visualized in a, uh, a browser or explored, but they are not in, in the GIS, not yet in the utility network. They are, they are there until the process, can, uh, uh, business process says, now you can update GIS, and that may be a certain period of time. So there is a flexibility, Dennis, and uh, we have seen implementation where data can be pre-posted, uh, shared with the rest of the organization, and uh, then when the process can, uh, requires update uh, utility network. Okay, great, thank you. Um, do we, we had a couple of other questions that have come up too, and I know we're approaching the top of the hour, so we'll have to keep this, this kind of brief. Um, uh, you know, we got some, some feedback on the fiber and the coax. We really appreciated that. Uh, I will just comment too that we have a you know, pretty rich uh, user community, um, so we, we welcome all kinds of feedback uh, related to, to any other input you may have. Um, there was another question. And I'm not sure how much time we'll have to answer it, but I am going to, to pose it to you also, you know, Jim and Sergey. Um, how would a load data integrate into this workflow? You know, if if, uh, if a load is still being leveraged was the question. And uh, and I know Jim, you you did a little bit of a response there. Um, do you want to just comment on that? And I'll, I'll let Sergey comment also. So. Sure. Yeah. The. Uh... Questions like that, I always want to know what your use case is, right? I want to dig into a little bit about how you're going to use it in the design and, and what you'd like to see out of the design. With with our rules engine and our, our capability of, of creating tables and reporting kind of on the fly that are, you know, also configurable, um, we can leverage that data in a lot of ways. It's just going to depend on how you want to use it. So. Um, at a high level, we have the ability to bring data in from a GIS or from an engineering database or from multiple GISs or from like if you had Esri Geo database and Esri Utility Network, we could bring data in from both of those into a single design or yeah, you know, and, and customer information systems or customer and planning systems. So so yeah, it's a. a not an easy one to answer succinctly and accurately, but if you would like to send us the, the question and establish a communication link, we could, can provide you some more guidance on that too. Sergey, did you have any other comments on that? No, it, it just under, underpinned the flexibility and we've, um, through our experience, we've worked with quite a few uh, data sources. Low data is another data source that we have transformations to, to use that data in design and update it back if it's required. Thank you. Great. We are at the top of the hour, and uh, you know we we certainly welcome the opportunity to uh, hear you uh, hear any questions you have. You're welcome to send questions to info at spatialbiz.com, or reach out in other ways if you know some of us or how to access us. So thank you very much for your time today. We hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Um, take care, everyone. Thanks. All. Have a great weekend.